Over the last five years or so, I start the term off by giving a lecture about effective learning to the students. And once in a while, a student will ask if they could have the notes for their sibling or someone in another course. Uh, and I've often said that I will make a video and post it, and, and I have never gotten around to it. But at the same time, every year I add more material to it, making it a little bit better. But I think it is about time to do that. Uh, and speaking of about time, um, the truth is that I don't understand why we, we don't institute uh, some training about learning uh, into our education system. When I was an undergraduate student, there was times when I struggled, um, particularly in engineering in my first year, I really had a hard time. And, and I took the time then to try and find out why, why I was struggling and if there was something I can do. And fortunately, I came across some information that really helped me a lot. And, you know, I only had to make a few small changes to uh, really impact uh, my performance. And, and it has helped me ever since. Um, and sort of that ignited an interest in how people learn uh, in me that I've, you know, sort of followed up on over the years. And I really hope that I can pass uh, some of it on to the students. So right now we're going to talk uh, for the next 30 or 40 minutes about taking the time to learn how to learn. And I think it starts off with sort of the student taking ownership of sort of their own intellectual development. Uh, I think that uh, maybe in high school or lower levels of education, um, there's been a little bit more hand-holding, a little bit more direction, um, and, and it is wonderful to have support of family and teachers, and, and that's what we all strive to have. But at the same time, we can't inhibit the development and ownership that the students should take in their own development, okay? So what is a university education? Really, it, it, it is learning how to learn. Yes, you're picking up a lot of information, but it doesn't stop there. It, it really is starting yourself on a path of lifelong development and learning. So uh, it's about intellectual self-development. Um, and your professors, uh, you know, compared to maybe your teachers in high school, or you may think that they uh, aren't as interested in you as an individual. but. Part of it is really to put the onus on the student and the professor is here to help and guide. And, and there are so many interests and, and so many diverse topics uh, at universities um, that we don't want to really guide everybody in the same direction. We want the student to have the opportunity to, to make some decisions about what interests them. And, and we're here to help. And there's lots of supports and resources available. Uh, I'll talk later on about our learning and teaching center here at Dalhousie uh, and some of the things that are available. But really what I want to emphasize to the students is that it's the word self is the operative word in all of this. And that comes in terms of self-growth, self-development, self-reliant, responsible and independent. Okay, and I like the term intellectual curiosity. I think that, you know, once you ignite a little bit of a fire uh, in your, your growth and your learning, um, you know, you might be so curious that, uh, that, that it all really just becomes easier. Okay, I, I will jump around a little bit here. I'm no expert in these topics, you know. Uh, I, I'm certainly not a neurologist, and, and I have a bit of a pop science uh, understanding of these things. But uh, I think understanding a little bit about how the brain works and memory works and learning works can go a long way to helping you make the decisions about what is an effective way to study. Um, and I think one of the important things to, to understand is, is really that the brain, you know, we like to use the analogy of the brain as a computer. Um, where you basically store information in, in a memory, 
uh, and it sits there and we go through it in a logical list order to retrieve that information. And in reality, uh, my understanding is it doesn't work that way at all. Instead, it is more like a net. And you can see the picture here on, on the screen. We have a, a neural connections, which is a basically a neural net, uh, which is a bunch of individual ideas, if you will. Um, and the way that memory works is that it is very non-linear. Okay, so uh, ideas can form connections throughout different pathways through this net. Um, but, but most importantly when it comes to memory uh, is that that the best way to, to really keep something in your memory is to make it as entangled as possible into the net. Meaning you have to connect it to different ideas and different sensory perceptions uh, with, within your memory. Okay? For example, here I got a picture of an open pit that maybe we talked about in class. And when you first hear about it, it has a very tenuous connection. And it's very easy to just break that one connection and off it goes and you, you'll never think of it again. But if you start to learn about the different types of equipment uh, in the pit, uh, maybe the stability of the pit, maybe um, what it means to society to have uh, mined minerals, um, you know, then, then you start to deepen the connections and it's less likely that you are going to forget these things. So the point is, for me, is that when, when we want to set up to teach uh, uh, and we want the students primed to absorb the information, we want to sort of set up a bit of a net. We want to introduce a bunch of concepts um, where the ideas are going to come and sort of get entangled with all the other concepts. Okay? And this ties into in other ways too in how we store information uh, related to sort of physical processes or the textbook that you're going to read or how you write notes, um, where you sit in a classroom. Uh, all of these things are, are connected to when the idea arrives in your mind. So as I said, um, there's a lot of resources uh, available on, on these topics of studying and you know some of them sound like an infomercial, you know, a late night uh, commercial, you know, get more for less and those kinds of things. But you know, in some way the, there is that aspect to it. Uh, you can study a little smarter and maybe not necessarily harder. And the reason I show this book is because it may be a little bit old, but this is the book that I looked at when I was a student. And, much of this material uh, comes from this book. Okay, so how you remember is based on setting up a net, uh, as many connections as you can. And some of that is related to the topic, uh, you know, maybe a, a pit is related to equipment, uh, is related to gold, uh, is related to jobs, um, all of these things. But, but there are other things like uh, a connection that you heard the information or that you saw a picture of the information or you spoke the information or you wrote the information down. Each of those um, sort of uh, physical uh, reactions are, are also connected to those memories. This gives some numbers and some context to understand things. So according to this, this book, uh, you know, 20% of what you read, you might remember. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we have lectures at university instead of just giving you the textbook and saying good luck because, you know, your time is not, uh, uh, is not that useful if you only retain 20% of it. Now, you, you retain 30% of what you hear, which is just uh, a, a little bit of an improvement. Uh, listening there in class. Um, but if you also, you know, you see, uh, if you see slides, you see images, you see pictures, you see connections uh, between data, uh, then 40% uh, of what you see is retained. Okay. Um, and what you say, you remember much better, 50%. Okay. So 
this is all about the different uh, physical uh, connections um, in your brain. So in order to enunciate something, your brain first has to think about it, uh, what you're going to say, how you're going to say it, and make your vocal cords and mouth work to, to produce that. And, and that actually is connected to memory processes. And now the best one is 60% of what you do. Okay, so if you're in the lab environment and you uh, tangibly hold a beaker in your hand and you light the Bunsen burner and you, you smell, uh, you know, what's cooking, if you will, uh, and those kinds of things. Okay, so, but the next line is really the important one. So when you combine these sensory activities, you really retain a lot of things. So in a lecture, you're really reading a bit, hearing hopefully quite a bit, and seeing a lot. And you're combining a lot of different activities. Um, maybe you're not speaking, but hopefully you are taking your own notes. Okay, so that means you are thinking about what is important and you are writing it down and, and, and those sensory connections are also at play. Uh, in the lecture, you're not doing a whole lot maybe, but uh, that's why we pair it with labs as much as possible. So if you combine these, maybe you're going to, um, you know, retain things because you have developed such a rich net uh, of ideas and neurons that are connected to these technical ideas related to, in our case, mining activities. Lately I've noticed a bit of a trend of, of uh, attendance declining slightly. And I just wanted to show you a little bit of data to, to help you decide maybe if you want to come to class. Uh, I mean, I think engineers, we love data, right? So here, here's a little bit of data to think about. Um, and this just is, is a connection or, or a plot of the percentage of class hours attended over the semester versus the student's final grade in the course, okay? And uh, there's a line drawn here to connect it. Now, to be honest, <clears throat> you engineering students have all taken statistics, and this really, uh, probably has a fairly low R, R squared. It's not uh, as correlated as I would like. There certainly is some variability in there for, you know, different students, different aptitudes, different courses, all kinds of different factors. But I think it is pretty clear that there is definitely some kind of overall connection. Okay, certainly the low grades are connected to low attendance. The high grades are in some way connected to high attendance, but most importantly, if you look over here in this section, okay, there are very few students with high grades and low attendance, okay? So it, it really is important to show up for class, okay, so that you can get the advantage of all these multiple sensory connections. You pay a lot to go to university, quite a bit to go to each class and uh, really I think you should make the most of your time and, and really show up um, and, uh, and benefit. And I really like this quote here uh, and I think it's, it's true to some extent that the world is run by those who continue to show up, okay? Um, it's a marathon, not a sprint, okay? So what do you do in class? I think it's easy to sort of sit there passively and snooze away at class, or maybe you have the best intentions of, of focusing, but it, you just find it difficult and easy for your mind to wander. And, and that is because you're really not actively engaged. You know, there certainly are a lot of professors, uh, maybe me from time to time, who are not as engaging as we could be. But on the flip side, you know, are we there to entertain and make the students feel good? Or are we there to as effectively help them grow? So really, in order to do that, it takes a little bit on both sides. Okay, so the professors have to have some engaging materials, but also the students have to be active in how they are listening. Okay, and a really good component of that is making notes. 
okay? Making notes, okay? So obviously paying attention, there's, there's no doubt about that, but you know, it, it's not so easy to do in a world that is awash in distractions, okay? But the keys to active listening are things like tying what you hear to other concepts. Really, you're, you're just trying to activate your brain. Okay, so silently ask yourself questions. Where is the professor going with this? Um, how does this connect to other topics? How does this connect to other things maybe I've learned in, in other classes? Maybe jump ahead and think, well, what is the professor going to conclude about this? Okay, um, and just continue to engage. There are some other things written here that you might find helpful, but your objective, objective is to just try and make as many connections as you can to retain this information. And, uh, and that way you make the most of your time in class. So what else to do in class? Active listening is note taking because really it is part of, of active listening. Really, I, I see a lot, uh, a lot of times today, you know, when we provide a lot of the notes, um, that it is hard for students to sort of continue to, to take notes. Um, the flip side are those classes where we write everything on the board and the, uh, the student just copies everything down. Um, now the downside to that is you don't have as much time to, to focus and learn and ask questions of yourself if you're so busy writing. Uh, plus, you know, the class is then limited to how much a professor can write on a board uh, in an hour, and uh, it turns out it really isn't that much. So we need to find this balance, okay? And so in my classes anyway, uh, I like to provide the slides in advance, but they don't have a lot of uh, written text on them, and you are expected to take notes because I believe that helps you to develop. Okay, so you're active listening, and now you are writing notes. In order to write notes, you have to understand what I'm saying, think about what I'm saying, digest to some extent what I'm saying, and decide what words you're going to write. And then actually the, the process of writing the notes themselves, the mechanical behavior of your hand, okay, and that connection is also then connected uh, to your memory. And, and believe it or not, there's even a spatial component. You may perhaps remember that you wrote a comment about so-and-so at the bottom of your page or at the top of the page, okay? And you can accentuate that with colors and highlighting and, and, and all sorts of things, okay? So there are many types of note-taking. Um, you can go online, YouTube, and see all kinds of these. Uh, I encourage you to find what works best for you. Um, there's a simple outlining method where you basically write down the major headings and any sort of important thing I say, like in my classes when I give away questions on the midterm all the time. Uh, another popular method is the Cornell method. Um, and there's some really great uh, resources for that. Uh, there's an example over here on the right. Um, basically, you have your note-taking area, um, and then you make a column for major keys or major cues and issues. And then at the end of the day, at the end of your lecture, you put a little summary of, of those notes in your own words at the bottom. And really doing this, uh, helps you uh, to, to connect many of these ideas together in an extremely active method. Um, a lot of my students, uh, they take the notes directly on the slides, uh, which I provide, and I find that helpful. Or you can just use a classic binder and note the slide number, which I put on all the slides, and, and take whatever notes that you think are appropriate. Also, there are um, mind map methods that are, uh, you know, another way to accentuate your note taking. Okay. Um, I'll just quickly jump over here and show you a few examples of notes in my class. So here are some slides, and this student got an outstanding grade, uh, A+. Um, 
and, and he basically fills in some notes all the way around the slide. Sometimes uh, you may want to adapt how the slides are printed to give yourself room or the right amount of room. This is not the time to try and skimp too much on paper. I mean, I know the environment is important, but so is your mind and your academic development. So you need to balance those uh, for yourself. Okay, so take some very good notes, uh, whatever is most meaningful to you. Uh, here's another uh, example of a student, a good student in a different class of mine who, who took notes the more classic way, making references to slides and dates uh, and some highlighting and so on, you can see. Okay. Um, and down here I just have an example, a generic example of uh, Cornell notes. Um, okay, where you have your key concepts and a definition. Okay, and then your notes as you're going through class over here. And down in the bottom just some of your own summary and important concepts. Okay, so listen actively, take notes. Okay, already you're very busy. It's going to be almost difficult to fall asleep in class uh, at that point. Okay, um, effective reading is a lot like active listening. Okay, although there are a few t different techniques because when you're listening to me lecture, you have no control of what order I'm going to speak. But when you have a book or a paper, you can flip around to, to whatever you want. Okay, so I think really it's important when, when you read something, first look over the major headings and create an outline, right? So you're already priming your brain to receive the information into a net. Maybe then you just read the conclusions at the very end or some kind of summary of a chapter. Um, so you know what's going to come out of it and then all of a sudden you're starting to ask yourself questions like how, how does the author get there? Um, what are they going to set up? What equations and theories are going to be involved? And you're really starting to prime yourself like an appetizer before dinner. And then, you know, get into it. There, there are more techniques to, to reading. You know, there's, a, there's lots of books you could look up. But I just want to accentuate to you that, that it's important not to just passively work your way through it, wondering what happens next. Well, then what happens? No, instead, Get yourself involved in it actively and intellectually and really digest and absorb that information and make the most of the time that you have uh, reading. So when you're reading actively, you have the luxury of jumping around a lot. Okay, so you want to read the title, the keywords, the abstract, maybe even look into the author and uh, where they're from, what university they're from, things like that if you're interested. Um, then again, jump right to the summary, the conclusions, um, review the outline and the headings, and, and really think about, you know, how it comes together and start to evolve some questions, some speculation. Um, plant a bunch of seeds just ready to fill out that net uh, of information. That will really help you to retain this information. Okay, again, I, like I say, I jump around a little bit, but now I'm going to return a little bit to how the memory uh, in general works. Um, it, it is quite fascinating. It's also how people make decisions is fascinating. I've recently been reading a book about uh, how we make most of our decisions intuitively without a real deep um, intellectual balancing of rationality. Um, and, and that's because of evolution. Uh, I guess when the saber-toothed tiger came breaking across the plains after us, uh, we didn't rationalize everything and become paralyzed by analysis. We just bolted out of there as soon as possible and, and came up with a strategy later. Okay, um, so so the, these things come from from evolution essentially. Okay. But uh, again, we have a bit of a, a net in there, and it doesn't serve to, to help your memory by simply saying to yourself, don't forget this, okay? Uh, it doesn't work that way. You have to 
systematically change how the information is received in order to retain it. Um, and so part of that equation is understanding this concept of a net and priming that net and getting it ready. Um, and another is understanding the interaction between short-term memory and long-term memory. Now, in a way, that is, again, kind of consistent with the analogy of a computer with its RAM and its ROM. Um, but you do get information into your short-term memory that you really need to somehow transfer down to your long-term memory. The truth is, if everything that went into short-term memory then went to your long-term memory, you would be just overwhelmed because there are just so many stimulus just looking around. All the colors, the words, the furniture, the faces. It is simply just too much. But your brain has to kind of filter that. Okay, so that is part of the process. But there are some techniques that I think that can really help you to transmit your course materials into your long-term memory most efficiently. And I think this chart tells the story very well. Um, and it's kind of a quantification, again, great for us engineers. Down here we have time on a log scale, okay, from 30 minutes to a month. And up here we have the percent of our course material that we have retained. Okay, so if you have been really active and used all your sensory uh, perception and, and tried to capture as much information as you can in class, then one month later, when the midterm comes, you remember between 5 and 10% of that material, which means for some students, if you choose to cram the night before, you have to relearn all of that material, which you just sat in class for an hour or an hour and a half to retain. Um, and if you have to find that time for all of the material, there just isn't enough time. It just just does not work. And, and even worse than that, from my perspective, is when you cram for something like that, it's in for a day or a short time, and then you you write your exam and maybe you're successful, but you probably could have been more successful. But then you lose that material and you go on to the next course uh, and, and you haven't retained much and you go on to your career. And, and I've heard people say that when they got into their career, they had to relearn everything all over again, like they had never learned it in the first place. You know, I use this method that I'm going to describe here, and I didn't have that experience. Uh, I found a real meaningful connection, and I felt, felt that that helped me a lot. Um, okay, so, so let's contrast this simple passive study approach to, to this other curve here. And what this shows is that if you sit in class, and then maybe a short time later after class, you review that material and bring yourself up, you know, to 100%. And it didn't take a long time to review all that material, okay, um, that you just learned. I'm thinking more like five or ten minutes, uh, not relearning it all like the night before, a month later, um, which would take a substantial amount of time. Okay, just top yourself up in five or ten minutes to 100% again. Well, here's the trick. You, if you've done that, you don't need to repeat that process again 30 minutes later. No, you retain at that time quite a bit longer, okay? Maybe twice as long uh, before you have to, you know, top yourself up to 100% again. And then that time horizon stretches again. Maybe it's, you know, 12 hours to top you up to 100%, okay? and then a day, and then 10 days, and a month. Okay. Now this is to retain 100% of the material, okay, how frequently you have to study it. That really isn't the goal for, for most of us. You know, we want to retain, uh, you know, a reasonable amount balanced with our effort. But basically what it shows is that if you, in the short term, 
uh, sort of review your material quickly and then review it consistently but at a more spread out time frame, you are going to retain that material very well for a long time with relatively minimal effort. And when the midterm comes, uh, you're not going to have to study nearly as much to retain much more. And a few additional benefits come from this. One of them, to me as a, as a long-time professional, is that you're going to take this information on with you to your next classes and then on to the rest of your career. Uh, and so this one is really, really important uh, to me. Not only that, but it ties to, to, to another important issue, which is studying a bit for mastery, okay, which I think I'll talk about a bit, a bit later. If you don't retain any of this information and then you show up for the very next class, you really takes you some time to understand what I'm talking about. You've kind of forgotten all of that stuff and by the time you're up to speed with me, I'm, I'm already down the road on a new topic. So it really hurts your ability to stay up with the class and absorb material. But if you've reviewed it a little bit beforehand, when you come into class and you sit down and I start uh, with the lecture, um, you are right on it, okay? And you're going to retain that new information even better. So it's kind of a cyclical process that can, can really benefit you. So what does this say, say to me and I hope to you? After every class, that night, you should spend five to ten minutes just reviewing that material. And then a few days later, have a look at it again. Okay, and then maybe, you know, extend that horizon and just do a little bit of continuous studying to stay sharp. I instituted this into my studies when I was an undergraduate student. And this one technique alone plus the note take. Obviously, you have to do the note taking and attend your classes. But this one technique alone really had a, the biggest single effect on my performance. Okay, uh, I thought I'd touch a little bit on, you know, for interest, uh, some other ideas about memory. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a thing called the Memory Olympics. Uh, and, and really, it's not necessarily special people that uh, have the memory of elephants and so on, but people who have mastered some, some important techniques. And I think everybody knows about mnemonic devices and uh, acronyms and, and even how to sing a song to remember the periodic table. By the way, why can you remember something so well if you sing a song about it? It's because it engages so many senses and you're, you're so many neurons in that net, okay? What does it take to remember the words? What does it take to actually sing it? The rhythm, the melody, okay? That really engages so much that it really is hard to forget. So it's important to understand the consistency with all these other concepts of why these observ observable uh, effective memory techniques work, okay? Another one is called a memory palace. Um, and it turns out that, uh, you know, people have been studying memory a lot uh, over the last decade or two uh, related to dementia and, and even related to trying to help people forget traumatic events and, and things like that. Well, <clears throat> it turns out that our mind has an incredibly strong aptitude to remember spatial locations. If you think about it, um, you know, it's amazing how easy it is to forget uh, somebody's phone number, well, especially today when nobody uh, really needs to remember it anyway. Um, but what is remarkable is, if you think about it, you can probably remember every house or apartment that you ever lived in. You can probably remember the layout of that house, where all the rooms are, doors and windows, closets. And I think you probably remember where all the furniture was in every single one of those houses. Um, I remember today some of the museums I visited. Um, uh, 
in Europe, and I was really fortunate to, to visit some nice ones. You know, I can remember where this painting was, where a bench was next to it, where some lighting was. Um, it, we really are, are, are blessed with a great spatial memory, and, and it's important to try to connect that. And I think even some of you might have an experience with that just in terms of your schoolwork. Maybe on a test you don't remember exactly uh, the answer uh, to the question, but you might remember it was at the top of your page of notes um, above a, a picture of, uh, say, uh, a, a, a caterpillar or something like that. Okay? Uh, so there is that connection. Anyway, so, so if you can tie uh, spatial memory to other memory needs, like trying to remember uh, um, uh, maybe the periodic table or, you know, the example I saw was a grocery list. Uh, and basically, uh, you can imagine a building that you know well, your house. And you can say that that's going to be your memory palace to remember your grocery list. And then you picture yourself going into the house and, and looking in the living room and seeing on the couch um, a whole bunch of steaks uh, sitting there, okay, ready to be cooked up next week. Uh, and then you look over at the uh, piano and there's a, a tuna fish sitting on the bench. Um, and above that is a great big bowl of pineapple. memory Olympians um, make all these connections uh, by tying the information to sort of some kind of spatial memories that, that you uh, are, are much easier to retain. And another thing to keep in mind is the thing I described sounded completely ridiculous. Well, it turns out the more ridiculous it is, the easier it is to remember. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about performance, okay? Uh, I don't think students necessarily often think of themselves as mental athletes, um, but that's how I view students. You're really in the business of performing, okay? So you train uh, for most of the term, and then you sit down at the exam, and the exam is in some way a performance because it's a given amount of time where you have certain tasks that you need to perform very well at, uh, sort of a one-shot deal, and, and that really is, is a kind of a performance scenario. So I think it's important to treat yourself as a, as a mental athlete, essentially. And there's important things to keep in mind. One of them is to really train uh, and learn how to focus, okay? both in your studying, your listening, your reading, um, and also when you're doing uh, questions yourself, getting ready for the exam, okay? So like with a lot of athletes, it's important to balance focus with rest because if you just try to focus unendingly, you will fail uh, like everybody else. So usually you want to try and study uh, limit your studying to sessions of 40 or 50 minutes maximum, and then be sure to give yourself a rest of 5 to 10 minutes. Um, and, and, and that's important to not let this rest uh, get out of hand and turn into 30 minutes or something all the time, but really try and balance these focuses. Okay? And by the way, we have learned long ago that the concept of multitasking does not really work well when it comes to trying to achieve some substantial performance. Uh, I think it was back in the 80s and 90s that people said, oh, let's just do everything at once. Well, it is clear today that the human brain is really not good at that, okay? That really it's best at focusing on one thing and then focusing on the other thing, unless they are two easy mechanical things, okay? And studying is not that, okay? So trying to study while simultaneously watching YouTube, um, even if it's about another course, uh, and also texting your study group uh, and all of these things at the same time, ultimately hurts you. So I suggest that really you just focus on your work, 
take adequate rests, get it done, and then enjoy life. Okay? Cramming. Are you kidding? Okay? It just doesn't work. And I showed you why, really. Um, and I told you about the downsides. When you cram, uh, you're simply going to maybe perform adequately on the midterm or exam, but that information is gone. It's not going to help you on the next class. Uh, it's not going to help you in your career. Really, you're kind of wasting your time and short-circuiting um, your own potential. Okay? And, and I know this quote is not accurate, but, but, but whatever. Uh, if you're an Olympic athlete, you, know, you don't wait till the night before your event and do 10,000 push-ups and hope that it'll be beneficial. Okay? In some way, cramming is, is a little bit like that. Um, not really, of course, but what it really shows you is, again, that chart. You have to do a little bit at a time over a long period of time, and then you can just do a nice tune-up before your performance. Okay, so that kind of connects this analogy of athletes and mental athletes. Okay, so I, I encourage you to try and follow through with that. Okay, again, I, I, I alluded to this before. Um, oh, and I should have given some credit to this. I, I heard of this concept of studying for mastery from Sal Khan. He has a nice YouTube video about how to study for mastery and the importance of that. Okay, so students sometimes, uh, you know, get bored in class and, uh, you know, they daydream and so on. And, and frankly, they maybe even don't see the point of the class or why the material is should be studied or, or learned in the first place. But really, if you take the time to understand each and every topic, you might find that there's a lot more to it than you originally thought. That, in fact, it is a bit more interesting once you wade into it. Now, personally, you know, I'm a very curious person. The more I learn about anything, uh, the more it starts to become a bit fascinating. Well, just about it. So that can extend to your studies if you really give it a chance. You know, obviously there's something about the topic that was of interest to you. You, you signed up for the program, um, and maybe this course is not the one you most wanted to attend. Um, but, but someone decided that, yeah, this is an important component of the whole thing, and give it a chance. Uh, see if you can awaken some curiosity and, and do well and, and also enjoy it. Okay, the other thing about studying for mastery is, is really trying to master each and every topic, all right, so that when the next topic comes along, you can also have a chance to fully understand that one and master it as well. I think it's almost, unfortunately, easier to understand this in, in sort of a negative example. If you really don't take the time to study something and you get, say, a 50% on, on the first test, and then the materials build on that to the next test, and, and maybe, you know, how are you going to do well on that test if you really didn't understand the material that all of that was built on? Okay. And then at the end of the course, you know, maybe you, you have truly an understanding of less than half of the material, but managed to, to get by. Then you take the next course the next year that is built on the previous one, and you just don't have the background. Okay, so not only are you setting yourself up to be unsuccessful, but in my opinion, you're really taking away any opportunity of, of even enjoying it or, you know, uh, uh, at least getting the most out. Okay, so really try and think about trying to master as much as possible each topic as, as it comes along and build. Okay, I'll say just a few words about cell phones and devices because, you know, honestly, today there's just so much made of this. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't say a few words about their role in studying. And obviously, Distractions today are, are, are really uh, a challenge. Uh, I spoke of this a little bit when I talked about um, uh, multitasking and so on. Uh, I'm sure you're most, most of you are aware 
that uh, the current designers of cell phone apps have a lot of input from psychologists and experts in addiction and trying to basically keep people's eyeballs glued to these things as much as possible. And when you are a young adult, um, really you're just learning a lot about making decisions and good choices. And, and it is difficult to, to try and balance that, I believe. At least that is what students tell me. And also, it is my own experience personally. Okay, so it, essentially, it is not your friend when it comes to studying. Okay, um, and also, it really does hurt your sleep. It hurts your ability to focus. Um, and I think I'll just leave it at that. But connected to these devices, I often hear reported students talking about leaving their device on overnight on the pillow next to where they sleep. And their sleep is constantly interrupted all night by banging and pinging and the fear of missing out on some event or other, which almost always turns out to be a non-event and of no consequence to you compared to the harm it does in taking away your sleep. So again, when it comes to being a mental athlete, focusing and resting, the most important part of it is sleep, but not in my class, obviously. Okay, so you have to sleep properly at night. Now, for many years, uh, people didn't know why you needed to sleep. Um, you know, no idea. I mean, I think it was known that if you didn't sleep, you could actually die. Um, but, but people didn't really understand why. Uh, now, again, I am not an expert in this, but I have heard that recently some studies have revealed that when you sleep, a fluid is released in your brain that essentially in some way cleans out your brain. You know, it cleans out uh, all dead cells and, and things like that and really rejuvenate your brain. And that if you don't sleep, it, uh, or you limit your sleep, it can be a lot like being intoxicated, um, which is uh, maybe fun at times, but certainly not conducive to doing well uh, in your academic endeavors. Okay, so try and focus on sleeping. You know, it's kind of a tricky thing. Today's study groups are very popular. Uh, they can be very effective and very useful because, as I said earlier on, uh, you benefit a lot when you speak, okay, when you say the content. I don't think it said it in earlier, uh, in some of the earlier information, but the truth is if you are the one teaching your colleagues, that is the absolute best way to remember things because it, it you have to understand the topic so well to, to, to express it to others. You have to think about what they might not understand, what they might be having trouble with, and, and, and really get the message across. And that really sticks in your memory. And that's one of the reasons, you know, that professors uh, tend to remember a lot of this minutia that, that um, kind of boggles the mind at times. Um, but study groups do have their downside, okay? Uh, a lot of times, honestly, when I see a study group, a lot of times they're, at least one of them is, is using a device. Um, and if you have, say, four people and four people have devices and they are going off nonstop, uh, it is so difficult to, to, to really focus on your studies and, and get things done. And I think there's a bit of a culture uh, developing today that, uh, you know, spending long, long hours in these study groups, really with all the best intentions. But the reality is I see, you know, very little focused work um, and, and not as much benefit from this. Um, so, so I think this study groups uh, should really be, you know, carefully considered how much time you spend with them and when. So, Another thing about uh, working with study groups is they can keep you on track. They can, you know, help you with your assignments because uh, you have different perspectives, right? 
but there's sort of a natural personality dynamic at play. Um, some people are more inclined to be leaders and some are more inclined to be followers. Um, and a lot of times the sort of leadership type, they, they start things, they start the problem off uh, going in the right direction and, and others sort of kind of follow behind. Well, when you get to the exam, those people are not there. Okay. And most of the time, students that struggle with sort of mathematical based problems, it's a lot of times they don't know where to begin. Uh, and part of that stems from a reliance on a study group. Really, you have to learn how to start the problem yourself. So when it comes to assignments, I really encourage all students to take the time to independently read through the assignments, take a shot at getting started with every single question before you then join a study group and, and work things out together which, you know, that, that can be really effective combination of things. But you really have to focus on doing some independent work because ultimately it is an independent evaluation and independent growth of students that we're, we're here to, uh, to work on, okay? Don't cram. It's really just a short-term solution to help you get a piece of paper and not an adequate growth uh, or development of knowledge or, or intellectual capability, okay? So, I mean, that, that's, that's one way to go, but, you know, it, it, it really, you get out of life what you put into it to sum up, okay? So try and go with several shorter study sessions uh, and you can pace them out nicely. Um, I really think that that's beneficial. I recommend that you do work with a friend uh, or a small study group, but that you make sure to give everyone the, the independence to, you know, be the leader at times. Um, and also make sure that you have looked through and taken a really good try at all the assignment questions before you get in that group. Um, there's also many different types of learning approaches. I touched on this earlier when I said uh, about you know, reading or listening or seeing or doing. Okay, so you can try and adapt these things uh, to your uh, study style. So everyone is sort of like has a different aptitude for different study approaches. Find out what works for you and see if you can tailor your studying approach in some way to, to make the best advantage uh, of your own abilities or how you, you best digest material. Get enough sleep at the right time, okay? especially before you're going to do good performance like the midterm or the exam. Now, lastly, if you did any one thing, it is please review your notes at least five minutes after class and five minutes before class. So you are right on the ball with the topic and you get the most out of your class. Now, honestly, uh, this one thing really uh, is three things, okay? Because obviously you have to attend all your classes and you have to take some good notes in order to have some to review. So again, if you do any one thing, do all those three things. This is just a, an example of um, some of the programs that the Learning and Teaching Center has for students, okay? And they put out a bulletin like this uh, a couple of times a year. Keep your eyes open and, and maybe see if you can attend some of these things. Um, they also have a, a good one about procrastination. Oh, I see that's the first one. Yeah, the, I've heard that that is uh, very helpful for students. So thank you very much um, and I encourage you to really find the sort of balance of, of approaches that, that works best for you. Uh, we all have busy lives and we have to balance how much effort we can put into these different study uh, techniques um, with what we want to get out of it. But I think that uh, the combination of approaches that I presented here um, has something for, you know, all uh, levels and, and, and I think almost any student could benefit from some of these. 
I know that I certainly do. Good luck.